wants to kind of listen to it retrospectively, it will be available. I think we can get stuck into it. And if as people join, you can just kind of, yep. Yeah. Oh, as I say that. Hi, Doron. How are you going? Hello. Good. Thank you. We were just about to get started. So perfect timing. Okay. So yeah. Beth, take it away. Oh, well, thanks um, to everyone who's joined. Um, and thanks to Beck for inviting me to come talk. Um, just so you all know, this is my first public speaking engagement. Um, so I am a little nervous, actually. Thought I'd just put it out there. Um, I've got a lot of content to share. Uh, and, yeah, have a pen and paper uh, ready because I might ask you to do uh, an activity I might uh, you know you might have some questions that pop up along the way and there is a Q&A box you can put them in um, or you might feel more comfortable to write them down I'm a bit jolty is everything okay yeah yeah okay um, and I'll give you a little uh, obviously I'm a play therapist so the information and the sharing I'm doing tonight is from the lens of a a play therapist um, and a lot of you might not know what play therapy is so I'll give you a, a brief overview basically play therapy is uh, evidence and research based um, therapeutic intervention uh, for children at the moment which might be effective for adults but um, all the research is done on children um, and it, it's a, mod a, a therapeutic intervention based on on uh, attachment theory, child development, um, psychology theory, and uh, it's aimed to assist children with various um, challenges um, and able to uh, assist them in accessing their higher, their higher levels of, of brain activity, um, but at the same time, say, uh, being able to access their lower brain areas, which we'll get into brain development in order to help them feel safe and secure and um, uh, I guess be at their, at their best. Um, so there's a bit of a wonky description. I, I'll give you a bit of an introduction of myself. I, trained as a, a physiotherapist a long time ago. Um, I've lived and worked in uh, Israel for a long time. I trained in Australia but it worked in Israel and um, my main focus was actually uh, more Pilates and women's health. Uh, I trained in lymphedema um, support and treatment uh, but I always wanted to work with children. I just didn't get really the chance to do that as a physiotherapist. And when I moved back to Australia, um, I moved back with my, my daughter and I, I really felt that, that I needed to change and, um, and re-qualified as a play therapist over COVID, actually. So I currently work at Playroom Therapy in Melbourne East um, and see a variety of children um, with various challenges and um, and presentations. Um, so I will invite you to take your pen and paper, hopefully you've got nearby you, or um, you can also visualise what, what the next activity we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to invite you to draw a picture of yourself as a child um, doing something that you love to do. Um, if you don't fancy yourself, you know, an artist or don't feel comfortable drawing a picture of yourself, um, maybe choose a few words or, or a few sentences to, to describe uh, 
what you might be feeling or what you might be doing. So I'll give you a few moments just to do that. It can be the first thing that pops into your mind. And there's only a few of us here. So if you do feel comfortable sharing, um, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. But maybe you can put your hand up or. I've just unmuted everyone so everyone can like, uh, you know, if they want, can share as they wish. Okay, I'm happy to share too. I, I thought of, I had, I did this exercise earlier. Does anyone want to share what their drawings like? Uh, I'm happy to share. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Dota, um, so I, I didn't draw, I'm definitely not yep. an artist, but um, what what comes to mind for me is, uh, so I would, I would have drawn myself um, sitting and playing my guitar and singing. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and can I ask, would have you been alone while you were doing that? Uh, yes, that was the yeah. initial, yes. And how old were you, this memory, um, how old were you when it popped up? About 10, I would say. 10, yeah, yeah. beautiful. What's What's the feeling you get when you remember that experience? Um, I guess it just like a, a, I don't know, I guess a feeling of happiness and goodness and warmth and light around me. That is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so it was something that you really enjoyed doing, it sounds like. You were happy yes. to do it on your own. Um, I wonder if you felt um, a sense of like you're mastering something that you were, you know, challenging yourself and getting really good at it and feeling proud of yourself. Yes, definitely. And also just getting yeah, a lot of joy. I just get a lot of joy from music. Do you still play guitar? Yes, very much so. Amazing. <laughs> That's a beautiful image. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Sure. Rebecca, do you have one for us? I do. I do. I have a, well, I drew myself with my ducks when I was <laughs> eight. Um. It's just like a photo of me holding them and, you know, we're just kind of very soft. We didn't have, you know, conventional pets as, as children. We didn't have, you know, dogs or cats, but we um, acquired some ducks from the Queen Victoria market um, <sighs> and we had them for years. Like we, and it was really um, amazing to like, I don't know, grow up with a pet that was, and we used to just hang out in the garden. So you just play like kind of running around the garden after them and like yeah. more of a na almost nature type play. Yeah. I can see you as a little child. Imagine lots of laughing and giggling. Yeah. And would you do that on your own or was that with other family members? Oh, with my mum. Like we kind of looked after the like the pen together or cleaned it and organised their food. That's nice. Nice and a nice memory too. I, I'll invite it, ever, anyone else to share um, if they want to. I can. Oh, Deron's getting on board. I've got a matching gun uh, to Lana's. <laughs> oh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> I'll get mine on and we can, you know. <laughs> uh, first thing came up for me was playing with my uh, G.I. Joe toys in the garden under the hiding under the plants yeah amazing and sounds like you were making some little stories up yeah having the best time also a little bit in nature were you <laughs> on your own during that one yeah <laughs> uh yes yeah i was Where's your mommy? no it's not on there she um <laughs> yeah i'd be yeah i'd be home my siblings older so i'd kind of have the afternoon sometimes to myself and I'd play play that after school. Amazing. Are you and mommy on the That's seat? a beautiful memory. So I've got two memories 
of a child, you know, happy to play on their own. One's doing music play, which can be really joyous and regulating. You got uh, Rebecca who's running around connecting with her mum and, uh, and, you know, in nature, being physical. You got Duran who's doing imaginative play on his own, happy making some stories up, also yeah. kind of lying in nature. It's it's good to be a kid. It's fun, you know. <laughs> so actually, you know, play is not something, is not a skill that is necessarily innate within all children. It's a skill that has to be learned through experience. Um, it's a developmental um, skill that, that our brains have to be ready in order to uh, kind of externally uh, – externally be ready to play on your own with others um so it sounds like you all had uh good experiences with play and it can it can be a method a, a method to um help children make meaning of their lives as well so i don't know if Duran remembers you know what his play <laughs> stories were like but Potentially, it was two GI Joes fighting, and and children often do fighting play to, you know, experiment with that feeling of conflict with another and how to resolve it, or maybe danger and how to resolve feelings of danger and getting back to safety. Um, so we'll get into that as well. And so, I guess the other point is that play is important for our children to do to make time for them to do it. Um, to be able to experience like feelings that you guys are expressing of joy, um, of relaxation, um, of just some, you know, solo time or time to connect with others. Okay, just having a, a look at what we're going to cover tonight. Um, I will get into some theoretical considerations for what um, what we're talking about, which is transitions. Um, and it might be a bit of a lot of content, but the reason I, t I do want to talk about theory, and I do talk about it with uh, most parents that I meet um, where I'm seeing their children, is that we want to understand the why, uh, why we do or why I might be recommending certain things um, tonight. It helps us understand, you know, where our children are, are at developmentally, and how we can best support them at this, you know, in that stage of their life. Um, we will talk about preparing for transitions, how we can do that um, on a practical level, and um, some extra therapeutic skills to help with the with that preparation um, that are play therapy based. Um, so, um, I, again. Um, the idea of this chat is really just to, I don't have all the answers, but it's just a, a little snapshot into the play therapy world, why we do what we do, and to um, kind of spark a conversation between us. I'd love it if it, were, it was, you know, interactive and you've already, you know, uh, contributed, which is lovely, um, and feel free to contribute throughout the session. Okay. So again, why do we care about theories? Because we want to, well, as we say, play therapy is research-based, evidence-based. We want to know why we're doing what we're doing. Okay. So um, I'll touch a little bit on each of these uh, areas. Um, when we think about child development, there are so many different subsections of child development that we could um, talk about, but I'm going to try to uh, touch on a few, but not go too deep into it. Um, there's lots of, you know, great literature out there to um, talk about child development. Um, and attachment theory, we will get a little bit deeper into um, how we can best support our children through um, the connections that they have in their life. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, 
I will touch on that, but basically there's four main, uh, five main uh, needs that our child have in order to uh, reach kind of their highest self-actualization. So um, I will get into that as well, um, being very cryptic right now, um, and the play therapy theory. So I'm going to talk about child development and we're talking about typical, neurotypical children. And, you know, there are a lot of parents um, who might be listening, who might um, feel that their child is neuro, uh, not neurotypical, neurodiverse. Um, and there, are, there is some, you know, if you're feeling that um, this is irrelevant or, or it's good to know what maybe typical is, um, in order to understand if your if your child is having troubles in certain areas, um, and can indicate whether you need to maybe seek extra support um, down the track for a child that might not be um, developing the way that um, you would expect, or is having extra troubles in areas that might not be typical for a child of their age. Um, but I'm not going to get into um, neurodiversity tonight. Um, this is a little snapshot into a wonderful um, book, The Therapist's Guide to Child Development, The Extraordinarily um, Normal Years. Um, and I've just kind of picked what I thought might be relevant for tonight out of a big list of areas of child development. So we, could, we can think of child um, development as thinking about where their um, brain development is, we can think about where their uh, emotional development is at, where their psychosocial development is at, um, where their physical development is at. And, you know, sometimes we have expectations of our children, but if we look at where their typical development is at, their, at a certain age range, our expectations might be higher than what's actually expected of them. So it's good to know. Um, and we're... You know, we're talking about a child who's going from kindergarten to school tonight. So typically these are the age ranges. Um, and I'll try to give ex examples um, within each uh, area. Um, again, if you don't connect with it, some of these for your child at their age, at their age current age, you know, each child is unique, so don't don't be too worried. Um, so a five-year-old, you know, they might be using their, not really developed their logical thinking uh, as yet, so they're really going with their gut feeling with some of their actions and their behaviours. Uh, they're definitely learning from um, playing and repeated um, actions in their play children like to repeat things over and over again to get a sense of mastery. So you might see the, the child making the sandwich a hundred times in the play kitchen and that's okay. Um, they might have a little variation or they might um, play that in that repeated manner until they feel that they've mastered that and move on. Uh, children uh, at, at five years old might have some challenges differentiating reality and fantasy. So you get kids that are might have nightmares from watching things on TV or, you know, really think that, um, I don't know, turtles can turn into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, and don't understand that some things are not real. Um, consistency uh, helps with a child feeling safe, so having consistent routines. Um, you know, same time you go to school, the kinder, same time you go to bed, um, helps with feeling safe. Um, they're starting to express their feelings, even though they might be simple, like happy and sad, or you're nervous. Um, they've got generally getting along with their friends, not a lot of conflict in their play, or it's just starting to kind of show up. 
um, they're cooperative and eager to please others. Um, so you get, um, you know, uh, teachers often giving feedback. Oh, yes, they 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 listen to everything we say, and and are pretty good at following instructions. But they might get to five and a half, and and they're a bit less eager to to please, and they're kind of um, feeling their feet, you know, in the late stages of the last year of kinder, where they're kind of understanding what they do and don't like a little bit more. Um, they're also learning a little bit more about what's right and wrong, so growing their moral, moral compass. Um, and they might come home and say, oh, um, Joey was really mean to Katie today and I watched him say something mean to him um, or mean to her. And you might have a discussion about, you know, what's what's the how the right way to talk to someone is. Um, yeah, there might be a little bit of hesitance and insecurity at five and a half. Um, there might be some more conflict in play, uh, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing because you want children to be able to resolve their conflicts and negotiate in play. Um, I guess that comes hand goes hand in hand with you know less eager to please others, so they might you know voice their own ideas, which is what we want children to do. Um, they have more attunement to others, meaning that they are more aware of what someone else might be feeling, um, can develop an understanding of that and you know, adjust their, maybe adjust their behaviours or they might still have trouble, you know, um, maybe recognising someone else's feelings but trouble uh, moderating their own behaviours. I'll just move my little face to the other side. At six, um, which we're really getting into that start of school age, uh, all children might be turning six in prep. Um, their focus is increased, planning goals. So we can see that's that's brain activity. That's the higher higher brain is um, is is a, has, is developing and able to function. So that's why school starts at six because they have this the the brain capacity to learn to sit down to, um, you know, to uh, cooperate, um, they're able to better differentiate between reality and fantasy, um, discoveries and, and experimentation is a really great way for them to learn, um, they can be sensitive to criticism and that kind of goes hand in hand with that emotional volatility, um, so you might see a spike in like a emotional outbursts um and and it goes ahead you know when you go to school there's much more much uh higher intensity learning um so that it can be a fatigue that can also lend into being more emotionally volatile it's good to know what to expect as parents when kids start to go to school um uh, a lot of pride in what they are learning and what they can do um and they start to, uh, you know, select their friends, align themselves with people that are like-minded, you know, some kids that like to be outside, they align with the kid other children that like to be outside more, um, other children who like to do more pretend plays tend to group together. Um, they're really building that sense of autonomy um, and want to – and and feel that pride as well when they get the opportunity to be independent and build that um, autonomy in different areas of their life. Um, and there's that sensitivity to criticism or that that um, increased guilt that they can feel if they know they're doing something wrong. So they might lie to avoid that, that harder feeling um, and that, uh, goes again with that growing moral compass. They might know that they've done something wrong, so they lie to avoid um, the repercussions of that. Does anyone have it? That was a lot. I'm sorry. Does anyone have any questions about that? Silence. I just no, about. Oh, sorry, Alana, you go first. Yeah, not true. 
I've noticed that because Ariel is nearly six. Yeah. And we've noticed a bit more lying mm. to avoid. It's, it's not really to avoid punishment, but we've noticed a lot more lying. Right. And he's typically very emotionally volatile anyway, I would say. Yeah. Um. So, and it is, like, they've noticed that Kinder as well, when he's hungry particularly, and then they give him food, and then one of the teachers says he's like a different child. Yeah, like a snap, right? Yeah. So the, our brain, you know, his brains are working overtime and he needs he needs the energy input to, to keep him going. He's going to fatigue quickly. Yeah. So it's good to recognise that, be attuned to your child's needs um, and recognise that for him. Um, you know, <laughs> the his brain is growing and he needs the energy in order to keep it to keep it growing out at six years old the brain is about four times bigger than it at when he's born like so there's a lot of mm-hmm. uh, um, input going in at the same time he needs oh sorry he's putting a lot expending a lot of energy of his mm-hmm. brain to focus and concentrate and um, and listen so he needs that that input into his body um, and probably you know time to rest and relax and, and chill out as well and not necessarily mm. work, be working his brain all the time. Um, but the lying, yeah, it's it's something to pick up on and to gently encourage, you know, the truth and, and not um, necessarily – Punishing, punishing, obviously in play therapy, punishment is like a big no-no. It's more about, you know, connecting with your child, um, having conversations when they're not feeling threatened, not feeling Mm -hmm. um, that they're in kind of a fight-flight mode um, in order to, um, you know, discuss and, 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 and build their capacity for logic and reason. So you'd want to let them know that they're uh, that he is not going to get in trouble for telling the truth, um, and that if he's lying about a problem or something, that you know you can work it out together. That you're his partner in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'll just go to the next one. We're going to talk about attachment, which is all about that connecting, trying to to build strong connections with your children. Um, so um, I didn't get into brain <laughs> development too deeply, but um, the brain actually is an organ that develops over time. You're built you're born with a with a um, intact, working um, brain stem which helps you know children with their um, temperature regulation um, their heart their heartbeat their their breathing um, all those regulatory uh, functions of the body um, and as a child grows so to each, each kind of level sequentially higher of of their brain so the next part of the brain, that's in major development after birth is your midbrain or your diencephalon, and that's um, your safety centers. So, um, and your sleep and your appetite and your movement. So, this is where our kind of play journey starts at building the safety levels through um, attachment um, and an emotional bond between caregiver, parent, and child. Um, and you know, if a lot of things can uh, challenge a healthy attachment at, at at the at the stage of birth, um, you know, parental trauma or um, yeah, uh, other things I won't get into. But um, there's it's basically it's never too late to to um, strengthen child parent attachment. Um, and we'll talk about that. So attachment is um, defined as the emotional bond between a human infant or child 
and its parent or caregiver. Um, and it's a developmental step to establish a feeling of security, safety, and um, healthy attachment can be de demonstrated by a calmness from the child while in the parent's presence. So that's a definition from the American um, Psychological Association. Um, when we talk about attachment, there's lots of different terminology that comes up. Um, I don't know if people might have been, you know, aware aware of it, um, but things like secure base and circle of security, um, all these terms we'll go through a little bit. Um, so I'm just finding some notes. Okay, why do we care about attachment? <laughs> because um, child and parent uh, relationships, they c contribute significantly to shaping and developing um, the child's brains and inner worlds. Um, so when a young child begins to explore the world, um, the infant is discovering who or she is reflected back in the eyes the face and the voice and the gestures and the touch of their parents. Um, a child who feels safe, loved, and their needs are met is able to explore uh, and experience the world to be safe and develop feelings and and, um, and come back, sorry, feeling that they are safe and that they can, can come back to safe open arms. So ideally, we want to, as a parent, be the secure base, develop um, the capacity to be the secure base for our children, um, really be that uh, the child recognises us as, as someone who is uh, consistent and, um, and reliable, someone that they can go out to and know, go out into the world and know that we will be there when they want to come back. Um, it's sometimes it's hard harder for the parents to to let go of the child um, in order to do that, and that can actually um, cause more of an anxious attachment style. Um, but in terms of secure attachment styles, a parent um, lets the uh, you know encourages the child to go out, watches over the child, delights in the child, and they're exploring. Um, helps when needed um, and is always there to welcome to welcome them back and um, is accepting um, of all their feelings and emotions and helps to organize those emotions and feelings for for the child um, so a big uh so Something important um, in terms of being that secure base would be the idea of authority. Um, so down here, this little note here says, whenever necessary, take charge. So um, it, it's very important for a child to feel um, that they're the child, that they're not necessarily in charge, that there is someone bigger and stronger and who, who knows the world that will protect them and, and, and set healthy bound boundaries where needed. Um, so I'm a firm believer that boundaries actually um, create safety. Um, and sometimes it can be hard for parents to put in place, but I encourage um, all the parents I speak to, to, to give it a go and, and there, there will be a positive benefit to setting healthy boundaries. Even today, I spoke to a parent who um, who said, I don't like barking orders at my child. And I said to him, it's actually, and he was complaining about his child having too much screen time. And so I just um, kind of offered a paradigm shift of not barking orders, but allowing his child to have the autonomy over um, how he spends his screen time. But the parent still um, having the authority over how much total screen time he gets in a day. So there's a boundary set, but the child still has a sense of autonomy um, to do with, with this activity. 
Um, so there is a way of doing it in a healthy, connective way where you're both partners in setting a certain boundary. Um, other terminology that I'd love to um, share is this uh, idea of an internal working model. So um, a child's internal working model is really how they perceive themselves um, and the world around them. And it's, it's based on the perceived safety of the adults in their lives, uh, the environments they're exposed to, and the experiences that they have. Sorry, someone wanting to say something? I think Doron might not be on mute. Oh, that might be me. Oh, um... oh that's okay. So, um, right. So, a child um, who, if we're basing it on, you know, their experiences with others, a child um, will feel worthy of love and attention if they uh, have the opportunity to feel love and attention. Um, if they're, you know, receiving feedback from their loved ones, if if they're if what if they're doing good enough, or um, if they're um, given the space that they need to when they when they need it, um, I actually I just scrolled. I had a I found a great meme on a, on um, Facebook last night. I want to share related to internal working model. Um, I'll just share it now. Uh, it was about criticizing our children. Uh, it was actually a bluey meme, and it was it was saying that when we criticize our children because we're angry or tired, they don't stop loving us. They stop loving themselves. Um, so that's a, a real insight into how we as parents can shape our children's self you know, internal working model, the way they view themselves, the way that we behave towards them. Um, it might be, you know, that we shout when we're feeling frustrated and then they learn to shout when they're feeling frustrated because that's how they've learnt um, the world works or, um, you know, they don't trust um, themselves to venture out in the world and might feel anxious because the parent is actually feeling anxious about um, them their child venturing out into the world and whether it's safe themselves. Um, so, you know, what we model for our children will help to shape their internal working model as well. Um, there's something called, that we call interpersonal neurobiology, which is where our, our brains shape the brains of the people in our um, within our in own environment, most especially our children, because you know they're the closest people to us. Um, and so, what energy, what um, actions we take in the world, how we model for our children behaviors, emotions, um, speech is is the way that they will model um, that the way that they will interact with the world as well. So they, as a secure base figure, we want to model that the world is safe, how to explore the world, um, how to, you know, um, how to uh, recognise things that are safe and not safe, what to do, um, how to, uh, in, terms, in terms of others, how to interact with others, how to resolve conflict, um, how to really address this emotional space, how to address internal feelings. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, a lo it's a lot of work as parents. We have a, a lot of responsibility. We have a lot to, um, to, to think about and to consider when we're just being ourselves. And um, 
there is room for us to, as adults, to always improve and to be uh, more conscious and more aware um, for the better of our children. Um, I'm not going to go into attachment styles so much. There's a lot of literature out there as well. We really want to just focus on this secure attachment, building our children's confidence and self of, self worth, um, and responsiveness to ourselves, to others, to learning, to the world, um, and really avoid these other kind of attachment styles. Um, and you know, the last two, are especially, kind of born out of uh, trauma. Um, and uh, like um, uh, parents that are really unreliable, unreli not present. Um, and, you know, you guys are here because you want to learn how to be more present for your children, how to support them. So, um, you know, if you're not already in the secure attachment style with your child, you're very much on the way there. Um, I mean, almost through the theoretical part of it, I'm s sorry it's taken quite a while, but it's quite important with young children to learn about co-regulation. Um, like I said, this idea of interpersonal neurobiology is a, a big factor in co-regulation with your child. You know, you've got your child that might have all these big emotions and and not know how to regulate themselves, and it can trigger us as parents, you know, their um, whatever brain activity is happening inside them, it starts to trigger the same kind of brain activity inside us. Basically, when a child's, you know, dysregulated, their higher brain areas uh, functioning is offline. So we call it flipping their lid, basically, and... Um, they're really in that lower brainstem um, area of functioning um, and that's the area that we would are aiming to regulate so they can start to access higher brain functionings. So, you know, if a child's um, not able to regulate themselves at age five or six, that's that's pretty typical um, and it's up to us to help them through that. Um, and you get children who really need that up until um, 12, 13 or beyond, you know, as part of um, their way of learning how to regulate. And hopefully, you know, we, as adults, then if we're doing that, that work for them at this age, then as adults, they'll be able to model that um, for themselves. Um, so in terms of, you know, talking about a big issue that set them, set your child off to be um, quite emotional and dysregulated, um, don't expect you're going to be able to regulate and talk about logical things like how to solve a problem or what to do next before their, their lower brain um, areas are, are regulated and back online. So our uh, first response really is to connect with our child um, and it might mean that you have to regulate yourself, step away from your child who's screaming and crying and, and go have a glass of water yourself, come and do some deep breathing, wash your face, you might come back to your child in their room, obviously you have to assess for safety and, and then um, walk away if you need to until you're lower brain areas are, are settled and you can start thinking logically what's the next step. Um, so, you know, ways to do that, um, to, to regulate that lower brain area would be anything rhythmical because we're talking about an area of your brain that's regulating, you know, heartbeat, breathing, might be tapping, might be punching pillows, might be stomping. You might want to just scream together. Um, deep breathing, obviously. Um, you might want to scrunch up newspaper, but connect. Um, uh, and once, once there's a little bit of, uh, re uh, I don't know, sub subdued or there's a little bit of less um, 
dysregulation, there's a little bit more control, you might want to offer an acknowledgement of how hard they're feeling, or how hard the feelings that um, that they're ex- uh, experiencing are, and and really acknowledge that even if you don't agree with, you know, the 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 key problem at hand, um, they might have hit their brother or sister. Um, they might have broken something. They might have lied. You know, it, it, that's not the issue. That's not um, what you're acknowledging in that moment. You're acknowledging that what they're experiencing, the guilt, the shame, it's really hard for them. It's really hard for them to experience that. Um, and acknowledging that feeling for the child can be quite um, connective, it could be shocking for them. They're like, yes, you know, it's like, yes, you understand me um, and and very regulating. So only once they're regulated do I um, recommend having that chat about the behaviours, not necessarily being the behaviours that we would want to see them um, see them do, um, whether it's the hitting or the um, whatever it is. Um, and that's it's a really hard skill, skill to learn how to co-regulate without going offline yourself. But I, I do recommend that because that will increase your connection with your child, increase trust, increase um, just a, an understanding from your child that you get them. I've said a lot. I've said a lot so far and we're not done. So I'm going to just take a moment now to um, invite any questions, invite you to write down questions for the end if you feel like it. And also think about the next part of this talk, which is preparing for transitions. Um, like to hear if anyone uh, has a way that they prepare for transitions themselves or they've prepared for transitions with their children um, in, the, in the past. And if not, I've got lots of ideas. I mean, I think like just talking through the like the st- I mean this is what I do as in as an adult go through like how are we going to get there what are we yeah. going to put in our bag just all the kind of right you know like what way are we going to drive what are we yeah. going to take for lunch all the kind of like physical yeah things yeah. that we're kind of familiar with to help us ground and feel um yeah um we do have a comment Oh yeah, from Louise. Um, you can unmute yourself if you want, but I can also read your question, um, or comment. Um, Louise said we have already started orientation sessions, which is fantastic. And- yeah, yeah, that is good. Basically, you know, our children are gonna go through one of the biggest transitions of their life so far. They're transitioning from a place that's safe and known to them. Um, with people that they know and a routine and they're moving to a completely new place. I mean, some of them, I don't know, some of the schools have um, kinders attached, but I know like even Yavna, like, you know, there are separate campuses. Um, No matter what, you know, new children will come, there'll be new teachers to wear a uniform, big changes. And, you know, we think about transitions we make as adults you know, we might move house, we might change jobs, we might move countries, um, we might move back like me. And it's, we prepare ourselves. We do the, we do the work, you know, we have a job interview, we, we might buy some new clothes to wear, we might, you know, time our drive to our new workplace so we know how long it's going to take. Um, we might, I don't know, we might have, um, if we're moving house, we might paint the walls, you know, we're really preparing ourselves for the change. We have to, our, our children don't know how to do that, but why would we expect them to be okay with a big change without the prep- preparatory work, you know? Um, and so that's our jobs as parents to do that for them. Um, and and a whole, a really in the long term or the prep, that there's much preparation that you do with the kids will help um contribute to them staying calm and regulated as they come to know what to expect 
of the change um, and potentially, you know, the earlier you start the process um, for the transition, um, process different feelings and build confidence that, you know, they're going to be okay and um, you'll be there to support them the whole way through. Um, they might have big feelings uh, and knowing that their parents are going to be there. And, you know, even as much preparation that we can do, there might be a lot of big feelings. But you as parents doing the preparation with your work, work with your children, it's going to make you feel more prepared as well for dealing with um, potential big feelings coming up for your children. Okay? And you can do all that lovely co-regulation work with them. Um, okay. So before we enter into our transition, we have to say goodbye first to kinder. Um, and to this lovely environment that's nurtured them for, um, you know, two to three years and they've got good relationships um, and relationship ending can be hard, you know, with the educators, people they see every day, with children they see every day that might they might not see anymore and with other, you know, kinder staff. Um, so, you know, expecting them to be okay um, it's not a fair expectation. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay for them to feel that it's hard. It's okay for them to get upset. Um, but there are ways of softening that, but not necessarily, you know, dis, um, uh, dismissing those feelings. We want them to have those feelings. Those feelings are healthy. We want them to know how to cope with them and, and move through them, not brush them off. Um, so you might think about preparing a photo book um, where, you know, they, you can go in and take a photo of something that they like doing or a, a person with their permission and, and the person might, whether it's an educator or staff or a child, might write a little goodbye note or the child might write do a little drawing. You might um, uh, prepare a photo uh, of of your child to give, you know, it might be a part of the card, uh, a card um, uh, transition uh, activity where they make cards out of photos that they've taken with people that are meaning, meaningful to them. Uh, my daughter actually made bracelets for each of her educators with their name, those little uh, letter, um, letter beads with their names in them. Uh, the kinder might have a ceremony. And if they don't, you might um, create one of, of your own in your home. Um, if there's no, it might involve making a like a cert certificate or something like that so they can feel that pride of, of, of ending something um, and feel really happy with themselves that they've got all the way through kinder. Um, you might start a countdown. That's a good way to prepare for the final goodbye where they also um, get to feel um, some autonomy over the process. You can get them to mark off little X's off a, off a calendar. Um, there are plenty of books about saying goodbye in the library. I don't have any specific uh, recommendations. Um, might be books about saying hello as well. Um, but you know, books are always uh good to il with illustrations that might show another child saying goodbye. Um, and then you get the ch the children that um all these kind they might just say no say no to everything and really have been having really hard feelings about the ending and and just not want to um uh participate and 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 you might just get them to paint out their hard feelings um, with lots of kind of sponges and things that they can splat and squeeze and, and get out the uh, uh, emotional energy of their body that way. Um, and then that painting can kind of be like their goodbye painting. And then saying goodbye through play. There might be role playing um, at home. Uh, it might be uh it might be play um 
with puppets, it might be dress up play, it might be practicing the goodbye um, with parents, with siblings. Um, it can be helpful. Does anyone else have any ideas for saying goodbye? No. Okay, now saying hello. So it might be a, a long, slow process that you might want to start quite early, even during the goodbye phase. Um, and really the, the aim is this process is to build um, confidence for, the, for going to school on the first day. Um, and like I said, no matter how much prep you do, it still might be hard on the first day. Um, and so, again, I've got little images here. These two are reading a book about starting school. Um, and you might want to talk with your child a lot about school, um, about, you know, what they and, – and do some imaginary talk about what might be like, what children's names might be like, um, what kind of things they might learn about. You might want to share experiences from your own time at school. Um, what school you went to, what your uniform was like, what kind of things you like doing, um, you know, real a positive spin on your schooling experience. Um, and you can also be really real with your child. I think it's really important to say that, you know, things can get hard, but you can always go to your teacher. Um, you can always talk to me about it at the end of the day. Um, you know, not every day is going to be a a good day, but, you know, there'll be good parts to every day, um, focusing on the positive but without dismissing, you know, potential hard feelings. Um, and you might want to practice wearing a school uniform around the house during some holidays. You might want to walk to school, walk, you know, or, or visit the school outside so they know what it looks like. Um, and again, there's those orientation days, which are really helpful. Um, and then we've got play again. So you can, um, you know, use a doll's house or use some doll's house furniture. Um, you can uh, do a bit of role play, teach a student, see what it's like, give them the, the um, opportunity to play out what it might be like to be the teacher. Um, it might act out being um, the child that doesn't know the answers or is um, being um, silly or but just uh, uh, any kind of imaginary play you might feel out um, the emotions that the child's holding inside themselves and it comes out in the play in relation to the big change um, and it's interesting you know as, as a play therapist, when, when you see these big feelings coming out and reflect on them for them and help organize those feelings um, without necessarily any judgment or trying to fix the problem, but just kind of hearing them, what they have to say, play kind of acts as a veil. So, you know, they feel kind of safe behind the veil of, of pretending. Um, and so more feelings often come out during those, um, those times. Okay, any questions or comments about those preparatory kind of ideas? No worries if not. Um, I know I've been talking for a while, so I'll go through the next um, the next part of it, which is really the therapeutic skills that um, I use, uh, I would use in the playroom. Um, to help um, help children kind of make meaning of their play. Um, so, you know, play playing with your child might sound easy. You might do it already, um, but how can I provide you with some skills to make it that little bit more meaningful um, for you to feel confident, a little bit more confident in playing with your child and understanding them, um, and and building your confidence to be playful and curious. Um, and so I guess a key thing, if you go back to that original um, 
sorry, the activity that we did at the start, remembering being a child feels like um, it's quite, I think for everyone, it was quite joyous. Um, so that's going to help when you're playing with your child to, to kind of access that inner child um, and connect with them on that, on their level. So we'll just talk about a few of these uh, topics as well. Um, okay, connecting in play. How do we how do we do it? First, we need to make um, we need to make time to play with with our children, and you know we're busy. Life is busy, so you might um, set a specific time of the week that you say, okay, special playtime for mummy or daddy and, and you. Um, it might be just, you know, parent and one child. It might be two parents and child. Um, but it's good to have a one-on-one -on -one time um, with, with the child that's making the big transition to see if you can really see, hear and understand um, what they might be putting out. Um, you might want to create a firm boundary around that time you might say oh we've got half an hour to play we've got 20 minutes to play um, and then give them excuse me an expectation of what's going to happen next so you know you can stick to those clear boundaries of 20 minutes say after 20 minutes you know then we're going to have a bath or after 20 minutes um, and, and then I have to go make dinner and you can help if you like um, so it gives them what to expect um, because children do love to try to try their luck and extend play as much as possible. Um, so uh, we will talk a little bit more about tracking. Uh, basically, it's the therapeutic skill um, that lets a child be seen and heard in the playroom without necessarily um, too much joining into uh, pretend play. If, if as a parent you're not feeling too confident with that, but you can still be with your child while, while they're playing and, and track, you know, their emotion, track their body, track the actions of their of their toys um, and be there with them. Uh, reflections. Again, this is a skill for parents to use in place of questions. Questions can be quite jolting, I guess, to the flow of play. And reflections are a beautiful way kind of to check in with the with your child, reflect any emotional output they might be um, expressing. So, for example, your child's like smiling, you know, ear to ear while they're like, I don't know, throwing the ball into the bucket and getting it in there. And you might reflect um you're feeling so proud or oh your body's really enjoying um that movement this movement right now um instead of oh are you having fun are you having fun and it really just stops the child um the flow of the play because you might think am I having fun is this fun oh yeah yeah it is but it, it's not necessarily um flowing it wasn't the greatest example but um it might be the dolls are playing and and the doll's hitting the other doll. It's like, oh, is that one really angry? Is that one really angry? Instead of just reflecting that the dolls are angry at each other because the child's deep in, in their pretend play, um, asking them a question uh, takes them out of the pretend world into reality where they have to, you know, think about the answer. And they might not have the answers and that can, Again, it can cause anxiety. It can cause a sense of like, uh, I guess, an unsureness of what what they're doing is right. Is mum is mum asking me or dad asking me whether they're angry because I'm not I'm not doing it right. I should be doing it harder, or or I'm not allowed to let you know be angry with the dolls. So best to just reflect, look back, sit back, look at what they're doing, and um, and try to understand what's going on for them. So be playful and curious um, and, and repetition is good in play. Like I said before, they're trying to master 
um, a certain skill. Um, you can always offer variation in the, in the play, um, but you know repetition is really indicative of them wanting to um, feel that they're mastering an emotion or mastering um, um, the sensation that, uh, in the play. All right, acknowledging feelings. Um, so I didn't write acknowledging emotions because feelings really could be your emotions and your sensations in your body. So we, we want to help children kind of recognize what's happening for them internally um, in their bodies and, and connect that to emotions. And this is, this is a really hard skill. I usually teach parents over like a full hour or so and we practice and practice and practice and it's, it, it sounds easier than it that it is, um, but we can kind of connect these two together um, and 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 make help children make meaning of of their worlds and what they're doing in their play. So you know, for example, um, you know, child built. Uh, built up their dollhouse or built um, some furniture in a spot and have some children sitting there with a the mother. And so you might track what the child's doing. Oh, you're really focused. You're really, um, your your hands are moving so carefully to put them on the seat or put them in the right place. You're breathing really um, smoothly and calmly. This is, and you might connect that to, an emotion seems like you're um, feeling really calm um, putting this scene together um, you might uh, wonder about the play as well um, and this reflections again we said instead of uh, questions I wonder what's going to happen next or I wonder what that doll might be feeling. Um, you might reflect about their emotions. So you look like um, you look like you're not sure what what you need to do. And sometimes just sitting back when they're when you've acknowledged that feeling of unsure can be really um, really powerful just to give them their space to make the decision instead of kind of helping them move on faster and faster and faster. Um, the last one is uh, prizing, not praising, uh, which is a hard one for parents to do as well, um, which is basically not saying, um, you know, how good boy or good girl or, or, you know, or how, um, uh, you know, judging, judging them for their uh, efforts or what, or th what they've done, the end, sorry, the end result rather than their efforts. Um, so it can, it can lead if it's if it's a constant kind of way of um, giving positive feedback to your child. It can lead, it can lead to a child kind of. Um, exhibiting people-pleasing um, uh, behaviours, doing things to please others rather than, you know, their own desires or their, their own, uh, for their own um, sense of uh, pride. Um, so instead of saying, you know, good job or good girl, you might want to try more of a process um uh, feed positive feedback like you know you you were focused for so long and you got it in the end um you look proud or you know you, you did it all by yourself um does anyone have any comments about that one because that's a hard one you know we often say oh good job um but It might be even just a a quick shift in in what you might feedback as uh, 
you did you did that for so long you must be feeling so good about yourself um So we're nearly at the end. Um, so this one's really about a, a play. So children don't necessarily have the, you know, the higher cognitive functioning to access their higher brain, their logical reason um, uh, functioning to, or to find the words to explain what's happening to them, um, how they, or how they're feeling. Um, but we do know that children hold memories in their bodies and can express their felt sense of the world through action and play. Um, so play really is that child's uh, manner to express themselves without words. Um, and it's an opportunity for parents to learn about their children um, being present for their expressive play. Um, so, you know, we, there's some beautiful quotes from some uh, big, ch big wigs in in play therapy, Gary Landreth, um, and some you know child de development theorists, um, Piaget, and it's uh, it's just play is really important because children do it all day long, and it's like I said, it's a kind of there's a veil there. Um, allowing them to experiment with different feelings, with different outcomes, um, with different behaviours and emotions that they might not necessarily have the opportunity to do day to day. Um, they might um, not uh, know how to express themselves necessarily through uh, like in a day to day um, in the day-to-day -day world, but, um, you know, there's a lot of stresses in the world, but in play, their lower brains are relaxed and they can access those higher brain centers where they can experiment with, um, different problem solving, different emotions, um, without the external factors of like, um, other people wanting their attention or stresses, of um, competing ideas, just say. So that's why it's important we can give our children that, um, those opportunities in the home. Um, a child might, uh, might let you know that they're needing more attachment to you as a parent through the play that they're requesting. And, you know, a child might show a, uh, show that they want to do more of attachment play, which is a bit might seem a bit more regressive or, you know, developmentally lower than what you expect them to want to do for their age. And I just tell parents that's okay. They're just telling you that they need they need some more security from you, especially if they feel feeling nervous, anxious or um tired. Um and it's really take that opportunity to follow their lead of what they need in the time and then slowly they build that that safety, that confidence to do higher developmental levels of play. Um, you'll know that they want to do attachment play because um, they want to be held. Um, they might want to do um, like peekaboo or hide and seek. Hide and seek is a beautiful activity um, to build attachment because the child hides and they have they they're building that knowledge um, with that the and security in their parent figure knowing that they're always going to be found again by by that person they're not going to be left hiding forever um, and you can joy you know join in joy together when when um, the child is found um, there might be physical play safety or rescue play um, where someone's, you know, in danger and being rescued. Um, there might be just, you know, walking and holding hands. Um, anything that you can do, you know, side by side or face to face 
um, to connect. Um, things like copying each other or doing, you know, patty cake or that kind of stuff is also really connective. Attachment play without just uh, – and children might also – want to pretend that they're a baby again and you're their mummy or daddy, you know, taking care of them as a baby. And something that children do sometimes before they go to school just to kind of remember and almost say goodbye to that stage in their life. And that's that's okay. How else can you um, prepare through play? I mean, in play therapy, the modality, there's different modalities. The mo the most um, common is non-directive um, child-led play therapy um, where the child really has that freedom and opportunity to, ch to choose what they uh, want to play in and show you, show you the inner world through their play. Um, so you might engage in small worlds, play with cars and little people. Um, it might be that attachment play. Um, they might uh, be showing you that they want to master something. They might be like ball throwing or or catching. Um, but, you know, using all those other skills that we spoke about, the tracking and the reflecting, they're the ways that you're going to connect with your child. Um, if your child's struggling a little bit to to play you might want to help um, with a gentle direction um, suggesting you know uh, and I'm, I'm saying this if you have a child that's also struggling with the transition and you want to help them a little bit with preparation you might want to dress up and do some role plays if they as teachers and students if if um, they're not kind of initiating that on their own um, you might want to do some drawings together, what school might look like, um, what people might look like that you that they might encounter. Um, and if they're really, you know, feeling nervous talking about it, you might want to engage in some sensory play. Uh, might look like just using kinetic sand to feel and touch and, and have gentle conversations once the um, – I'm doing this underneath the computer as I'm talking about kinetic sand. But often when the child's hands are busy and their lower brains are regulated, you might have gentle conversations then about what school might feel like, look like, who they might meet. And you might want to teach teach them some basic school stuff and empower them for that first day of school. You might do fun you know, maths games together or writing letter games together. Um, but something that, that you can then say, see, you can do it. Oh, look, look how you hold that pencil. That's great. You know, and just um, kind of encourage them um, and, and focus on their, you know, their strengths and what they can do leading into going into starting school. Now, spoken a lot and I am very happy to speak some more if people have questions um, you can catch me here at, uh, or email me um, if something pops up uh, if I've sparked something uh, and you think of being, thinking about it a bit later and you want to um, contact me feel free um, Beth, that was like really, really insightful. I want to just firstly um, jump on and say thanks. Thank you. Like I feel like I learned so like a lot of explanation for what and why, you know, certain behaviors from my children happen and not really